want to welcome everyone again, and uh, we have a, we're very pleased to have a guest uh, customer presenter today, Dr. Matthew Breen from North Carolina State University. He'll be talking about comparative cytogenomics, um, humans and canine cancer. So uh, let me just hand the controls over to Dr. Breen, and we can begin. Dr. Breen? Hey, thank you, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for those of you in California who got up extra early, and good afternoon to those on the other side of the Atlantic. So what I want to do this morning is talk to you, really skim the stone across the surface, but talk to you a little bit about why dogs in particular are a good model for cancer research, a little bit of background about the rationale behind all that, a little bit about the basic resources that are being developed, so nothing too technical. And then I'll show you a couple of examples about how we've used cytogenetic changes in dog cancers to help us identify or to really, really drill down on cancer genes that are likely to be of most significance in the corresponding human cancer. So we all are very aware on the call how rapidly genomic health is expanding. And it's very easy to surf the web any time today and just find a yet another company that started offering some form of personalized medicine. And probably 99.99% .99 of the web hits that you get will relate to specifically the human space. However, it's important for us all to remember that humans are just one species on the planet. And while we may think we are the dominant species on the planet, there are thousands, if not millions, of other species that can contribute towards helping us understand more about our own health. And this concept that we call One Medicine is absolutely nothing new. As you can see from this slide here, this is over 100 years old. The concept that really all animals are differential rearrangements of the same collection of ancestral-related genes may seem new, but the concept that medics treat one species and then the vets treat everything else that breeds is absolutely something that's been around for a long time. So how do we take this concept and use that to apply specifically to cancer research? And really, it follows on this Venn diagram. If we just surmise that all the research dollars, as the majority of them are, are pushed in towards one species, which would be humans, all we really ever learn about are humans. However, if we incorporate additional species, as you can see from the figure, we have an opportunity to identify genes that have been shared during evolution, suggestive of potentially a conserved mechanism of pathogenesis that help us to cross-filter across species in order to identify those genes that are likely more involved in initiation, driving, and progression. So the traditional cancer model, the laboratory mouse, incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful for use in a number of cancer research applications. However, most, most people will already know that mice don't really get that many spontaneous diseases. Mice tend to have we induce diseases, whether it's by chemical induction, by radiation. And mice live in a HEPA-filtered environment with sterile water and monitored food. So even though it's true that we have lots of developments with mice, we are very good at curing cancer in mice. Most of the rodent researchers I work with don't understand how they can cure a cancer in a mouse, but we all know that they, we can't do the same in people. The different approach that we take is we work on a variety of different species, and all the species that you can see on this slide are species with which we work, all of which develop some form of malignancy. But the importance about these species is that all their cancers are spontaneous. None of these species have induced cancers they all are naturally occurring. And when I think about the species in this list, what I tend to do as a cytogeneticist is I don't think about them as a, what they look like to us. I think about their differential genome organization and potentially how that can help us unravel some of the mysteries associated with genome changes that occur with cancers. However, we don't have time to talk about all these different species. And believe me, we could spend all day talking about all these different species. So all we're going to focus on is the domestic dog. And for those of you who haven't already guessed, this is a golden retriever puppy, one of the more popular dogs in the US. Adorable dogs, great family pets. Golden retrievers themselves are highly prone to developing cancers. And in fact, almost half of all golden retrievers 
develop one of three different major types of cancer. So why are we interested specifically in dogs? Well, these numbers are quite compelling. There are now well over 80 million dogs living in households in the US. And they live in approximately 60 million households. And for those of you that do live in the US, that tells you very clearly that a lot of people that have dogs have more than one dog. And interestingly, although we suggest that owners take their dogs for an annual health check every year, about half of people do. So 42 million dogs take their dog, take, sorry, 42 million owners take their dogs to see a vet every year, numbers according to the American Veterinary Medical Association. About half of all dogs in the US are purebred dogs, and the healthcare costs in 2015 are estimated to exceed $20 billion, which is a major economic consideration certainly in the US relating to the health of the animal, but also a financial burden to the people that have them. What's very striking is cancer is, and has been for a long time in the US, the major cause of death in pet dogs. 25% of all dogs will develop a cancer at some stage in their life, and 50% of dogs, if they live beyond age 10, will die from cancer. But what's more surprising is of those 42 million dogs that go to visit the vet every year, 10% of those dogs leave that veterinary practice with a diagnosis of cancer. So it gives us an enormous population of about 4.2 million. And I think this year the number is expected to top 5 million patients. It's a tremendous resource for us to consider. Dogs clearly need our help, but we can utilize their background in order to help ourselves. And that's primarily because in addition to pet dogs and humans having spontaneous diseases, when we sequenced the canine genome back in 2004, 2005, it became very apparent that the genome sequence of the dog was actually very, very similar to that of our own. But even more importantly, unlike the HEPA-filtered environments of laboratory mice, pet dogs live in our environment. They breathe the same air, they drink the same water. When we throw a ball across the grass, our dogs run across the same pesticide, herbicide, insecticide treated grass that we, our children, and some people's grandchildren run across. If the genome of a dog is very similar to a human being, it therefore follows that if there are any environmental impacts, which of course there are, that that genome-environment interaction could also be considered comparable between humans and their pet dogs. For that reason, and I've shown a few cancers here that have been particularly targeted as potentially ideal models to study between dogs and humans in order to really drill down into what's driving malignancies and genetic factors that perhaps relate to how those particular malignancies will respond. So just how similar are we to our dogs? I like to show this slide, which is getting old a bit now, but it really does demonstrate the fact that in addition to people tending to select dogs that do, do look like themselves, there is an increasing body of evidence that the genetic background of dogs is very, very similar and comparable to human cancers. And to fill you in a little bit more on that, I would encourage you to go and read uh, the Royal Society's journal that we published earlier this year, specifically looking at cancer across life, and read some of these papers which are really compelling about how cancer in one species can help inform cancers in another. And what this really goes to show is that in addition to what we call the one medicine concept, we can also talk about one pathogenesis. And that's because if we pick any malignancy that is recurrently affecting human patients, there's a very strong probability that we will be able to identify breeds of dog that have exactly the same type of malignancy that is much more prevalent in specific breeds than it might be in the human population. And with those numbers in mind, this is what I find very remarkable. Approximately, there are about 1.6 million diagnoses of cancer in, in the U.S. human population every year, which is slightly under 500 cases per 100,000 of the population. But when we compare that to dogs, it becomes very apparent that dogs have two and a half times the number of cancers diagnosed, but because the population is so much smaller, the overall incidence is well over 10 times. This again gives us an enormous opportunity to consider the dog for, ac for sample acquisition for comparative, uh, comparative oncology studies. So why is it that so many purebred dogs get so many cancers? 
To answer that question, we really have to wind the clock back maybe 15,000 years. And there's a lot of press out there now about where did the first dogs develop and where was, was it in Asia, in Southeast Asia, was it in Africa, where did the dogs develop? But I think most of the people in the field would agree that wherever that was, dogs probably developed from the wolf. And of course, 15,000 years ago, there weren't breeds such as a golden retriever and a Bernese mountain dog like the little puppy we showed on the last slide. There was really a wolf. And over a period of time, wolves would have predated on human populations. Over maybe thousands of years of nomadic lifestyle, wolves would have followed around human camps as they moved with the seasons. And ultimately, something happened that allowed the wolf to either domesticate, domesticate people or people to domesticate the wolf. And that would have happened in a very, very, very long time. And it actually resulted in a strong bond forming between humans and the then domesticating dogs to the extent that the dogs that then stayed with the tribes on the camps would themselves have bred and the dogs would have been bred specifically for their function. And if you think of some of the breeds that are well known now, that have been around for many, 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 many years, elk, hound, deer, hound, cattle, dog, retriever, it's really obvious what these dogs were kept for. They were kept to help human beings survive. But then something strange happened around three, 400 years ago. Around the time of the Industrial Revolution, the rich were getting richer, the poor were getting poorer, so it may not be that different to today. But what was happening back then is certainly in industrializing in, in England, the landowners, the mill owners, the factory owners, the nobility now started to have more free time. And during that free time, they now started to breed dogs specifically not necessarily for what they did, but more for how they looked. And there began the intensive form of inbreeding that resulted in modern day breeds that we see today. So over a lifetime of dog selection, probably only 2% of the time that humans have interacted with dogs has resulted in an intensive, intensive level of breeding. And that intensive selection has resulted in the breeds that we know today. And just to give you one quick example, this is a typical human four generation pedigree. You've all seen these. Females are circles, males are squares. And of course, there's usually, in most cases, two parents, two great, two four grandparents and eight great grandparents. This is how a pedigree is laid out. So let's consider Rex's pedigree. And this is blurred for a specific reason to maintain confidentiality. But the beauty of working with dogs is that I can go to a national specialty show and there can be four, if not five generations of dogs present for one family on the ground at one time. It's not uncommon to see a litter of puppies with both parents, all four grandparents, and occasionally all eight great-grandparents, and it's sometimes great-great-grandparents there at the same time. And it gives us a sampling opportunity to acquire specimens that we need immediately. So let's just look at this pedigree. This is Rex's pedigree. Going up the sire line and the dam line. So the father's always called the sire, the females, the mother's always called the dam. If we pick on this one individual that's purple, this one individual is Rex's mother's father's father, so it is maternal grandfather. And for those of you that are, have astute eyesight, you'll notice that this dog is colored purple, even though it's blurred. But this dog is also present three more times in the pedigree in the previous generation, but on both sides of the family. So what we actually have is that this one male dog, in addition to being being Rex's maternal grandfather, he's also his father's 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 father, his father's mother's father's father, and his mother's mother's father's father. So if we actually think about it in those terms, and then we look at Rex's five generation pedigree, this is how his pedigree would ordinarily present it. But we identify that this one male occurs four times in two generations on both sides of the family, the maternal and paternal line. And there are also two females that are present more than one. So if we draw Rex's pedigree the way it should be drawn, which is any individual should only be present one time, this is what Rex's pedigree now looks like. So you can see how it starts to get a bit complicated. And that one red male that I've shown in the middle, he's actually passing his genetic information to Rex down all four grandparental lines. So the net result is Rex is starting to have a reduced level of genetic variation 
by inheriting genetic material through fewer common, through more common ancestors and there's less diversity. Today, I think there are now about 186 breeds registered at the AKC and the dog, as you have probably read in most of the popular literature, has an incredible amount of morphological variation. Within breeds, there is considerable restricted genetic variation but so if I take a DNA sample from a Yorkshire Terrier in Florida and a DNA sample from a Yorkshire Terrier in Seattle, the chances are those two individuals will be much more closely related to each other than either is, say, to a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. The level of genetic variation within a breed is significantly reduced. However, across all breeds, if we took a DNA sample from every one of the breeds and mixed them together, that level of genetic variation truly reflects the level of variability that we would see in other animal populations, including humans. So breeds are broken down into these seven major groups, largely groups according to the way that they appear, of course, but also some behavioral traits and their historical development. So if you look back just a couple of years to 2013, and I know you can't tell me what the answers are, but I'm going to ask you anyway, is that if you think about the most popular dog in the US, for a moment, and then I'll tell you that the most popular dog in the US for a long time and continues to be is the Labrador Retriever. It's about 15% of all purebred dogs, which means one in six dogs walking around, purebred dogs in America, is the Labrador Retriever. If you think for a moment about what the second most popular dog is in America, that happens to be a German Shepherd. So again, it's about 9%. The third most popular dog is a Golden Retriever. Everybody's apparent favorite, but third in the nation. And the fourth most popular dog, ironically, considering this is the dog that is the most widely used in institutions that have experimental populations, is the beagle. And what's striking about these data is it tells us that over a third of all purebred dogs in the US represent just four breeds. And actually, some of the most common cancers that we see in the US are highly, highly prevalent in these breeds, largely because of the sheer volume of numbers in the nation. However, when you look at the rest of the population, when we talk about the 150, the 154 breeds that were present in, back in 2013, it tells us that nearly four out of every five in the US is represented by just 30 breeds, with the other 150 breeds represented by one in five dogs. And that means there are large numbers of dogs on the U in the US for very, almost rare breeds. They're not necessarily large numbers each year, but they've accumulated numbers. If those breeds have a high incidence of particular malignancies, it's probably within a very closely related family because the breed numbers are relatively small. Now, if we look at how this helps us from a genetics perspective, this is how we kind of and don't worry about any axes on this, but if we look at human variation and then we look at overall dog variation, or that could be mixed breed dog variation, these plots are meant to show that they look virtually identical. I'm seeing a couple of white spots on here and I don't know why they appear. But if I ask you to pick the odd one out in either population, ignoring the white spot that shouldn't be there, you can't. It's difficult to do. However, if we look at purebred variation, purebred genetic variation, has been restricted to such an extent that it now starts to close down the, what we would call the background genetic noise. So if I put the outliers in now, it's very, very simple for us to look at purebred dogs, identify what the odd ones out are, but then take those data, translate them across with our human academic medical center colleagues and say, we suggest you go specifically looking at those particular genes in your human population, assuming, of course, that the basis of the etiology of the disease is shared between humans and dogs. From a breeding perspective, it really is a balance. So purebred dog breeding is a very tight balance between consistency for breeding for the traits that are desirable in that breed versus the ability to address particular diseases. And I have to say that the breeders that we work with are some of the most highly motivated people I've ever met to try and do something to help address the health concerns and reduce the incidence of diseases that we now know are in the breed as a consequence of the genetic problems that they may have. But regardless of that, it is true that dog, dogs get cancer a lot. 
And it's even more in, important to know that very many types of the most common cancers are also represented in key breeds. So if you look at these five cancers here, these are some of the cancers that are the most common in the US dog population. And I'm showing you some breeds that are highly represented in the cancer incidence numbers. And there are two breeds in particular that stand out, as we've spoken about before, Golden Retrievers and Bernese Mountain Dogs. These breeds in particular get rather an unfair share of malignancies, which is why we spend so much time working with them, because the breed clubs are very interested in dispelling with the cancer problem, but also there are a sufficient number of these dogs around for us to work with. So to summarize that section, we know, everybody knows cancer is a genetic disease. I told you that certain breeds of dogs are affected by certain cancers, but the importance being that they are spontaneous, naturally occurring diseases. And I've indicated to you that there are certain breeds of dogs that clearly have an inherited predisposition to certain types of cancers. And what that does is give us a very powerful opportunity. We can now look at the genetic factors that we see in dogs, but at the same time, in parallel, use that as an opportunity to help identify key genes associated with cancers in humans. So although I like to use this play on words, dogs are in, could be considered certain dog breeds of breeds in crisis. They really need our help. And that, of course, is a major veterinary issue. But selfish as we human beings are, we can still take advantage of the incidence of diseases in dogs. And as we help the dogs, we can also help ourselves. So then begs the question, OK, that's all well and good, but what are we doing about it? How can we take the work with our dog patients and use that to help accelerate what we know in people? Well, whatever resources are available out there for human cancer research, we use exactly the same resources for canine cancer research. And I'm just showing you the classic list of the kind of genomics approaches that would be taken in any kind of major cancer research site. We don't have time to go through all these today. So I'm just going to focus on the molecular cytogenetic changes that we see in the somatic cells once a cancer has started. And the, basic of the basics of the concept in terms of comparative oncology is to take the enormous amount of information that we have from the human species, but overlay that, as I said in the, one of the early slides, with one or more other species to identify those factors that are common, which will give us an opportunity to push forward the boundaries of health to both species. So we've developed lots of reagents that I showed you to start now asking the questions. And the first question that we asked several years ago is a very simple question. Are there evolutionarily related chromosome aberrations, so on a large scale, in terms of gross genome reorganization, that could be suggestive of an ancestral mechanism of pathogenetically significant events? As in, can we actually find chromosome aberrations in the corresponding cancers in humans and in dogs that would provide more compelling evidence that those aberrations are not there by chance. They have been there through evolution and shared now in both humans, dogs, and other species. So to begin this, the first way we approach this is to say, well, let's take some human phytogenetic changes that are well known, everybody knows about, and that are very well prescribed, very well diagnosed in human cancer patients and try and identify whether they similarly occur in canine cancer patients with the corresponding disease. And I've got dozens of examples of this, but I'm going to show you just one. And the example I'm going to show you is probably the most famous one, which is most of you that have ever worked in human cytogenetics will have heard of the Philadelphia chromosome, the BCR able translocation, where we actually take a region of bottom end, the distal end of human chromosome 9Q, involves a reciprocal translocation with human chromosome 22, resulting in co-localization of BCR able, which is a new fusion gene, which is a tyrosine kinase, which essentially tells the cells to go crazy. Historically, this has been evaluated by fish analysis, fluorescent in situ hybridization, to identify co-localization of a BCR enable on the derivative 22 chromosome. And this just shows an example of the kinds of things that we're looking at where the normal chromosome 9 would have a red and, a, and an aqua signal. A normal chromosome 22 would just have a green signal, as you can see at the bottom. But the derivative 9 would be lacking the distal red signal. Therefore, it would just be blue, as you can see at the top. And the Philadelphia chromosome would have co-localization of the green and the red signals, BCR enable. 
So with that in mind, we set to recruit dog patients with chronic myeloid leukemias, which of course are highly, highly associated with the presence of a BCR able translocation in human patients. Now, chronic myeloid leukemias in dogs are actually not very common or maybe underdiagnosed, but we probably see now between 20 and 40 cases a year, so it's not a huge number at all. Having said that, we collected a series of patients and then designed a fish assay based on using a canine equivalent of a BCR able probe set. And I've schematically shown this here just to demonstrate that the region of chromosome human chromosome 9 that contains able is actually ironically also at the bottom end of dog chromosome 9. And then the region on human chromosome 22 that has BCR is in the distal region of dog chromosome 26. So we're talking about completely different structural organization. But what we're surmising is that we would be able to find that in dogs with CML. So if we then fish these back clones onto conventional metaphase spreads of a dog, you can see that there's no co-localization of the signal. We've got the green signal on 26, the yellow signal on 9, as I've shown up here, no co-localization metaphases, and of course, no co-localization co in interfaces. In the translocation event, what we were or proposing we would see, of course, is co-localization of those green and yellow signals. And of course, I wouldn't be showing you if it wasn't there, but what we find now routinely in dogs with CML is co-localization of BCR enable. And of course, these spreads are never very pretty. But here we can see what's potentially a normal 9 and a normal 26. But then right here, which have enlarged up in the left corner, is co-localization of BCR enable, which we also see as a heterozygous condition in the interface nuclei. And we've taken that a step further because some of our CML patients are now being actively treated with one of a variety of forms of tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and these dogs are going into cytogenetic remission. So not only have we shown the presence of an evolutionary conserved translocation event based on a completely different set of genome reorganization events, we've also demonstrated that that protein can be precipitated out, and it's pretty much the same as the protein that's immunoprecipitated out in humans with CML. But in addition to that, dog patients also respond not as well, but similarly to people with tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy. So it gives us a lot of information. Now, I can give you many examples of that, but I'm going to stop at that one because that's OK. And actually, that's kind of what we would have expected, although people said it was nonsense. It wouldn't happen. It clearly does. But so what? That allows us to drive information from humans to dogs. But what does this mean for human patients in particular? We know for dog patients it means that if we can suggest that there is a comparable pathogenetic mechanism, that means, as we've just demonstrated, that the human therapies could be used to treat dogs with the corresponding diseases, subject to all the PKPD analysis and various toxicities and what have you. But from a medical perspective, what that really intrigues us about is it tells us that because the dog genome and the human genome have a vastly different genome organization, we can take advantage of that differential organization to really filter down and narrow down the genes that are potentially key with certain cancers. In other words, I believe we can use the dog genome, or certainly cancer genomes in dogs, to help drive gene discovery now, not from humans towards dogs, but from dogs towards humans. So to that end, I really need you to stop thinking about different species has different genome reorganizations for a moment. On the left-hand side is a typical human ideogram with 22 pairs of autosomes, and this is male, so there's an X and a Y. On the right-hand side is the canine standardized ideogram with 38 autosomes and an X and a Y. And of course, the first thing you notice is, apart from there being many more autosomes, they're all acrocentric, and they're actually a lot smaller. So that's what we think about if we look through binoculars and see dogs and people as separate species. But what I want to do is, again, to stop you thinking about dogs and people as different entities. What I'm now going to do is overlay onto the human ideogram the genetic information in terms of genome reorganization by overlaying the dog sequences. What you'll now see 
are a series of colored blocks. And each one of those colored blocks, at least at a gross level, are the synthetic genomic regions, what we call evolutionarily conserved chromosome segments of the dog overlaid onto the human genome. And there's no Y there because the human, the dog genome was sequenced with the female, so there's no Y chromosome in the canine genome assembly. But what you can see here are approximately 215 differentially colored segments overlaid onto the human genome, which breaks the human genome now not into 22 autosomal segments, but 215 or so autosomal segments that we can look at. How is that beneficial? Well, let's pick the baby of the family, human chromosome 22. Human chromosome 22, according to this schematic, is evolutionarily conserved to three regions on three different human chromosomes. And what I'm trying to get you to visualize here is if you actually look at dog 27, dog 26, and dog 10, and actually cut out the regions that are shaded in blue, green, and red, respectively, and then do a little bit of inversion, but line them back up together and effectively kind of virtually snip them with a pair of virtual scissors and then glue them back together again. We effectively make the dog equivalent of a human chromosome 22. That's essentially what it means. How is that useful? To give you an example of that, I'm going to talk about some work we did quite a while now on meningiomas. And we picked meningiomas as really the first solid tumor that was recognized as having discrete phylogenetic aberrations considered diagnostic. In human meningiomas, the hallmark that we see, one of the characteristic features, is partial or total deletion of that chromosome 22. Now, human chromosome 22 has well over 500 genes on it and is about 50 megabases. If the whole chromosome is being deleted in meningioma patients, we're really losing an awful lot of genetic material. How do we know which genes on that chromosome are actually of significance is the tricky problem. Lots of chromosome 22 we know occurs even in low-grade low grade malignancies in meningiomas, which potentially suggests that it's an early event. But the rogue in the, in the barn, I suppose, is NF2. For many years, people have studied NF2 as a because it functions as a tumor suppressor gene, and it's frequently deleted in humans with meningioma patients in humans with meningiomas. So we surmised, along with our evolutionary concern theory, that if dogs get meningiomas, which they do, a lot of dogs get meningiomas, then if people have been believing that NF2 is the major problem in human meningiomas, we can surmise that dogs with meningiomas should also delete NF2. But to back it off a bit, when we actually started probing with NF2 single locus probes, we weren't seeing deletions of NF2. So we broadened it out a little bit and looked at whole, chrom whole genome status. So if you think about human chromosome 22, the region of human chromosome 22 that's conserved where it shares NF2 is a conserved region on dog chromosome 26, as I've shown here. So basically, NF2 maps right here on dog 26 in the region that's shared with human 22. So what we did was to form whole genome CGH analysis to look for DNA copy number changes across the genome. And as in people, meningiomas in dogs tend to show a high level of whole chromosome aneuploidy. So these are the summary of the data. The green bars represent where we see gains of whole chromosomes or increasing copy number. And the, and the red regions are where we see obviously losses in copy number, and then the dog chromosomes 1 through 38 at the bottom in terms of autosomes. And then this is the human 22 schematic. So we can now ask a few questions. So do we actually see deletion of 26, which would include deletion of NS2? And the answer is actually no. If anything, we see a gain of chromosome 26 in about 20% of patients. So that kind of raid on our heart, brain under the parade of our hypothesis. But as we're supposed to do in science, just because we don't see what we expect to see, doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to try and find out what's actually going on. So to carry this story through, we can also ask about the other two chromosomes that are involved in being evolutionary conserved with human 22. So we look at deletion of 10. Do we see deletion of 10? No, we don't. Well, do we see deletion of dog chromosome 27? Actually, we do. And we see deletion of 27 in around 40% of all canine meningiomas. So what does that mean? 
Well, it means that if we buy into the hypothesis that there's an evolutionary conserved mechanism of pathogenesis, the region of human chromosome 22 that is shared with dog chromosome 27 is actually a tiny little 2 megabase region in the subcentromeric area. That region only contains about 10 genes. So we've actually reduced the region of interest 25-fold from 50 megabases to about 2 and down from over 500 genes to fewer than 10. And what we do now is work with our human neuro-oncology colleagues and are now exploring the functional significance of those genes in human meningioma patients. So those of you that are still astutely aware of this is that wasn't the most common chromosome aberration. The most common chromosome aberration in dog meningiomas was actually deletion of dog chromosome 17, which occurred in about 70%, the major aberration, major frequency. So what's going on there? Well, ironically, this is actually as important because deletion of chromosome 17 17, dog 17 is evolutionarily conserved with a region on human chromosome 1. And we know that deletion of human chromosome 1p is a characteristic signature in human meningiomas linked with initiation and progression that has a massive negative correlation with prognosis. So it's really bad news. And the human researchers that we work with have spent many, many years and many, many dollars looking at the 120 megabase region of human chromosome 1 to identify which genes could be driving this. If our hypothesis is indeed true, what we've been saying is spend less time looking at the region identified with the blue running ants and focus your time on the 10 megabase region that is evolutionarily conserved with the region on dog chromosome 17. So basically what this is showing us is that we can look at dog meningiomas, we can look at human meningiomas, and if we consider they share an ancestral mechanism of pathogenesis, we have an opportunity now to look at which genes are involved in both species to potentially help both species. So to give you a second example, I want to move inside, inside the body and lower down, and we'll talk about bladder cancer. Now, bladder cancers affect about 75,000 people a year. They're diagnosed by a variety of methods, including fish and now various new molecular methods. And in people, they're usually diagnosed relatively early. Because see, people may notice they've got changes in their urine. They may notice they've started to pass through. They may notice they're having a little urinary retention issue. They may notice they're getting recurrent cystitis. Dogs often don't do that. And the, often the symptoms of a urothelial carcinoma, a bladder cancer in the dog, actually are very similar to, the, to a variety of other conditions that we often see in dogs. So, for instance, dogs occasionally get bladder stones. Dogs get lots of bladder infections. And the infections cause lots of inflammation. So as a direct consequence, there are about somewhere between 40 and 80,000 diagnoses of a canine transitional cell carcinoma or a urothelial carcinoma, for whatever you want to call it, in pet dogs across the US every year. But there are well over 2.5 million cases of urinary tract tissues that could be bladder cancer. In other words, those 40 to 80,000 cases are among the 2.5 million. However, the challenge is, how do you know? How can we tell if a dog's actually got bladder cancer or if the dog's just got inflammation as a consequence of some irritant in the bladder? So routinely, veterinary pathologists will look at cytology from a urine sample. But that cytology can often be very misleading because it relies on looking at abnormal cells. Well, all dogs can shed abnormal cells. That doesn't necessarily mean they're malignant. Therefore, we move to imaging, ultrasound imaging. Well, yes, we may see something on an ultrasound, but that may be a tumor or it may be inflammation. It's difficult to tell. So classically, as we would expect, the only true way to diagnose a dog with bladder cancer right now is to take a biopsy and then look at it through conventional histopath. And that's usually done by cystoscopy, occasionally through other varieties, but we end up resulting with a piece of tissue that we can analyze to give it a confirmed diagnosis. However, those particular methods in dogs are kind of like those mushrooms you often see in a forest, where as soon as you touch a bladder cancer in a dog, it poofs out loads of cells. And that can cause the tumor to seed elsewhere in the bladder. So there's a reluctance to go poking around in the bladder. As a consequence, when I spoke to the veterinary oncology community, one of the major asks that they had 
was a demand to develop a free catch urine diagnostic assay for bladder cancer in dogs. When we look at bladder cancers in general, the age distribution of them, maybe 40 to 80,000 dogs, is fairly comparable. Is that it's really a late onset disease, but about 90 percent, 90 or so percent of all dogs will develop bladder cancer over the age of about five or six. So it's not a young dog disease; it's an old dog disease. But what we find, though, is by the time dogs are routinely diagnosed with bladder cancer, one in five of them already have distant metastasis, and over 60 percent of them all have local metastasis to, re to regional lymph nodes. So what I'm saying is, by the time we identify it's actually quite late in the day. And the majority, unlike in people, the majority of dog bladder cancers have already invaded the muscle wall. So they're quite advanced tumors. And that's because the dog doesn't know it's got cancer. You can't complain about a bit of discomfort. And you don't often witness your dog urinating unless it has an accident inside the house. So as a consequence, is to show is that there is a variety of dogs now that when we look at the diagnostic accession, are strikingly frequently occurring with bladder cancers. And that's what these six dogs all have in common. These breeds of dogs here are all have a highly elevated risk of developing a urethelial carcinoma. And when I talk about elevated risk, I'm talking about beagles, westies, and shelters with about a three to five risk. American Eskimo dogs have a 15-fold risk. And Scottish Terriers and Jack Russells are now called Parson Terriers. They have an 18 to 20 fold risk. That means they are 20 times more likely to develop bladder cancer than the generic dog walking into a vet's office. And it's starting to have a major impact on the health of these populations. So what we did, and now those of you that are Nexus copy number users will start to recognize these images, is we use, we use Nexus all the time for our copy number analysis, primarily because I think it just presents really nice data, and it allows us to visually present to clients and explain to them how these genomic data actually look. So this is an example of just one urethelial carcinoma in a dog. You can see the classic nexus copy number plot across the top with gains and losses throughout the genome, and then the canine-specific ideogrammatic form, which is what we get to use to explain to our veterinarians because they understand the lower figure, not the top figure. So that's one case. What we've then done is actually profiled lots of cases. In this first study, we just did 31. But in, within those 31 dog bladder cancers, you can start to see some remarkably highly recurrent changes here. And what we identified is that three regions of the canine genome are massively re recurrent in terms of their aberrations in bladder cancers. And it's so high that when we look at these three regions of dog chromosomes 13, 19, and 36, the key thing to remember is they're unidirectional. They don't have gain or loss, it's gain or nothing, or loss or nothing. And when you look at these figures, gain of chromosome 13 is present in 97% of all urethelial carcinomas in a dog. Gain of 36 is 84%, and loss of 19 is nearly 77.5%. In combination, what this told us when we do the statistics is that 100% so far of all bladder cancer patients we have looked at have two or more of these aberrations. With all of them, we have yet to find the bladder cancer from the hundreds that we've looked at that don't have at least two of these aberrations. And it gives us odd ratios in excess of 500, relative risk in excess of 40. These are massive numbers. But more importantly, the misclassification rate is currently zero. So having used the Nexus copy number data, we then do what happens in the human field is we go and identify fish probes specifically for the regions of interest. And here is the four color system. Chromosome 8 is not abnormal in dogs with urethelial carcinoma. So there's our internal control. And then 13, 19, and 36. What we do are now collect free catch urine samples from dogs with suspected bladder cancer. And they pee into a cup. We collect the cup. We start to spin the cells, and we probe them. When we probe the cells, as you can see, this isn't just a normal cell. In the control cell on the left-hand side, obviously, we can see two copies of 8, two copies of 13, two copies of 19, and two copies of 36. However, in the malignant cells, the situation changes. Because now, of course, we can see additional copies of chromosome 13 and 36, and a reduction in copies of chromosome 19. So that's great. We gave the veterinary community what they wanted which is an early diagnostic test for the presence of bladder cancer in dogs using a free catch urine assay. 
From a research perspective, though, we didn't stop there. And we went through now a process that we called genomic recoding. And this is really what we wanted to do to drive gene discovery for urothelial carcinogenesis. And we've actually used this process now several times. But I'm just going to pick on, spend on the theme of bladder cancer. Let's think about the canine urothelial carcinoma. So if we go back to that dog profile again, these are those 31 cases of canine urothelial carcinoma, the same nexus plot that I showed you a while back. But now what we've done is recoded the data so that now the data aren't presented in nexus as though they are dog patients. They're presented as though they are human patients. So we've taken all the genome coordinates of the probes and our arrays and translated them into the corresponding human coordinates and now output the data in nexus copy number as though those dogs were human patients. And that's beneficial because what we can now do is identify where those regions go. Chromosome 13 in dogs here is split across a region on human 4 and human 8. Chromosome 19 is divided across chromosome 2 and another region of chromosome 4. And chromosome 36, ironically, is adjacent to the same region, to the, the deleted region on chromosome 2 on the NARC amplification. But what we can then do, and this is in collaboration with uh, Josh Shipman's group that we work with at the at Huntsman Cancer Research Institute, is pull 285 patients that have human urothelial carcinoma and essentially do the same thing. But now we can compare directly dog data as humans with human data. And this means you don't have to think about which bit of chromosome is which, because we're looking at the data directly. And you can't really do it on this gross scale. But I'll pick a couple of chromosomes to show you. If we look at human chromosome 17 and dog chromosome and the dog equivalent, you can see that generally these two profiles are largely comparable. If we divert to human chromosome 8, now we start to see a difference where actually the p-arm is fairly similar, but the q-arm has a drastic difference in that the distal half of human chromosome 8 also is evolutionarily conserved as a gain in the dog, but the proximal half is not. So we surmised here that the genes that are probably associated with driving neurothelial carcinogenesis, if indeed, again, they are evolutionarily conserved, are present in the distal half of human chromosome 8 not the proximal half. And we've actually pushed this further now and reduced it down to just one or two genes that are now being evaluated rigorously for their role in neurothelial carcinogenesis. So that's bladder cancers and the meningioma, but they actually form a very small proportion of, and this is slightly out of date now, but a slightly largely growing cohort. So we have comparative data now for over a dozen different malignancies in dogs that we also see in people started to notice in all cases is that when we cluster the copy number data, as we would normally expect, we see differences. These represent 60 cancers from a dog that the pathologist told us are all identical. Matthew, they said, I cannot tell the difference between any one of these. They're all of this particular type. But of course, as we all know, molecularly, we start to develop more information. When we cluster the copy number data, it's very evident that these actually break into four clusters. From that molecular data, though, in our dog population, that have then been treated with appropriate therapy, we can start to ask these questions. Do any of these recurrent aberrations actually correlate with subtype and or prognosis? Well, the, the pathologists say, I told you, I couldn't separate them. But when presented with the subgroups and we twist their arm a little, they do start to see some subtle differences, but it's lost in the noise. But do they correlate with prognosis? And the answer to that question is yes. Because what we found is we can now identify from these four subtypes which of those dogs will respond to the therapy on which they were based and which ones will not. But equally important, we can answer yes to the following question, which we can take these subtypes, overlay the subtypes onto human patients, and then similarly identify if there's a correlation between which human patients responded to the same kind of therapies that were used in humans. So it's an exciting time to work in comparative oncology. As a summary slide, effectively, we take the whole gamut of tools that we have. We also add in environmental impact. We work on a whole range of different tumors with our toolbox. And as we work on the animal cancers, those data are then interchanged with collaborators in the human medical centers to identify things that are shared to allow them to go ahead and advance their own studies 
while we persevere with the dogs. I would point out that the real key to all this is that it's okay just doing basic molecular approaches, but it's the pathology and the clinical outcome that is key. And that's why we spend so much time chasing down the details of our patients, because that's what gives us the opportunities to actually make a difference in the lifespan of the dogs and then ultimately human patients. So the slightly emotional slide, I would say that when we think about effective cancer therapies, as I often say to journalists, the keys to unlocking some of nature's most intriguing puzzles about cancer is probably walking right beside us. We can interrogate the cancer genome of our pet dogs and use that information to help the dogs, but also use it to help ourselves. And with that, I just wanted to acknowledge a whole series of people who were involved in this. I'm not going to read these names out because you can see them. But a lot of this work actually comes from a massive involvement of not just the people that work in my lab, but also other faculty members here at NC State in pathology, neurology, oncology, and statistical genetics and biostatistics, and then a whole army of collaborators that we work on throughout the world who provide samples but also provide intellectual input and co-design. So we run massive projects, multi-institutional projects, that bring all these data together. And then the groups at the bottom are the people that pay the bills. So I just wanted to acknowledge those. So with that, I'll say thank you. I'll pass it back to the host, and I guess we'll take any questions. If anybody, by the way, wants to consider a collaboration, please feel free to contact me. And if we've got cancer data that may be of interest to what you're working on in your human patients, for example, we'd be more than happy to talk about how we can help you with those things. So with that, I'll be quiet and pass it back. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Breen, for that uh, very interesting presentation. We're quickly going to take up a couple of questions before we launch the polls. It says, um, it looked from the bladder cancer example like aneuploidy played a bigger role in canine cancer CNVs than segmental rearrangements. Is that the case for most other canine cancers? So the answer to that question is, remember we're just talking about um, gross CGH data. What I have also got access to based on, if we've zoomed in on all the nexus plots, we can actually see many, many segmental rearrangements. But because a lot of those are balanced, we obviously don't see them on CGH analysis. When we look at structural rearrangements, we do see many of them. But there is an incredible amount of whole chromosome as well as segmental aneuploidy across all dog malignancies. But of course, because we now do a lot of tumor normal paired exome data, we also start to find the gamut of other aberrations that are also present there that are shared with people. So effectively what I'm telling you is people are dogs, and dogs are people. Okay, thank you. Another question, are mutts less susceptible or to cancer, or are their rates the same as purebred? That's a good question. So if you look across the US, about 50% of all cancers diagnosed in dogs are in mixed breed dogs. The difference between mutts and purebreds is what we call the Heinz 57 variety dog. How would you know if that is 75% golden retriever and 25% something else or a mixture variety of breeds? The classic thing about purebred dogs is they, are, they have a particular genotype and a particular phenotype that is recognizable and scorable. So when we look at cancers across mixed breed dogs, that's just like throwing the entire human population together. But if we look at cancers within purebred dogs, we can use the purebred phenotype and genotype as a background and then say that there are massively different frequencies of different types of cancers in different purebred dogs. Great, thank you very much. Um, another question is, what has your experience been with detection of mosaicism and LOH? Well, that's an, another excellent question. So the, the, that's a challenge that we've had because most of our arrays tend to have been based on just Agilent, um, what we call those G3 Sure arrays. What we're now starting to do is move on to arrays that can actually use SNP genotyping at the same time. So unlike in the human field where there's access to various platforms that can do copy number and LOH at the same time, that's really been critically lacking in the veterinary space. So we are certainly talking to a couple of companies about can we actually start to generate that. We know it's there because we see it in our sequence data, for example. So mosaicism, we see that a lot and it does affect our challenge. 
it just challenges. We know it's there because when we start to fish these cells, we can actually characterize the frequency of a particular group of cells that have gains and losses and various other parameters that we see. Great. Thank you very much. Um, as we're out of time, we're going to end the session now. I want to thank all the attendees um, for joining us today. And a big thanks to Dr. Breen for the um, wonderful webinar. And again, once the web webinar browser window closes, um, another one will pop up where you can type in any comments or feedback you have, as well as any additional questions you may have.